Welcome to the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. I'm Peggy Fair, and the host of the show. Uh, the Understand Photography Show is a podcast, but we do put the behind-the-scenes video on YouTube, and we we um, have a watch party on Fridays at 4 p.m. Eastern time. The show comes out at 4 p.m. Eastern every Friday. So we have done this show for three and a half years, I think have a lot of interesting guests, a lot of interesting topics. My guest today is Tom Vargelettis. He is a real estate agent turned photographer and has a really uh, pretty substantial real estate photography business. So he has actually written a book called The Full-Time Real Estate Photographer. And then he turned and started a podcast. So he has a weekly podcast full-time real estate photographer. So if you're interested in the business of real estate photography, you're gonna to want to tune into his podcast. But in today's show, we're gonna talk about uh, real estate photography in general and how to do it. Because a lot of uh, my audience is hobbyists. We maybe not wanna go into a business, but you wanna learn some techniques on how to do good real estate photography. So this is a good kind of a starter show for that kind of stuff. One thing you are going to learn is you're going to need a little bit of Photoshop. And we don't go into a lot of detail on that, but I just want to remind you that we have a really good Photoshop cram course on understandphotography.com. It's an online class. And the thing that's unique about our, uh, our software classes is they're very short videos. They're like you know, two to five minute videos of one concept. So what you're gonna learn in today's show, you're gonna need to learn about masking and layers. So if you sign up for that Photoshop cram course online at understandphotography.com, you're gonna see that. So welcome, Tom. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me, Peggy. And uh, so tell our audience a little bit about um, Tom, Tom Vargil. Vargelettis. Vargelettis. How'd I do? Yeah, Vargelettis. That's right. Vargelettis. <laughs> so give us your short bio. Um, and uh, my name is Tom. I, manage my, I own and manage my real estate photography business over here in Massachusetts. I got into real estate photography because originally I was a real estate agent and I had had some negative experiences with local photographers. So I decided to learn how to do real estate photography on my own. And uh, it took me a couple of years to kind of find my way, I guess. But uh, once I was able to produce high quality real estate images, people would ask me when they saw my listings who my photographer was. And they'd ask if I could send the photographer out for their listings. Um, after I got a couple of requests of, like that, uh, I decided that, you know, maybe I had something here and, and then I turned it into a business. And how were you a photographer before? No, no. Um, I have always been interested in business and I've been involved like starting and, and failing in many other different businesses, um, but never photography before. I mean, I've, I've had an interest in photography, but no more than anyone else who's got a smartphone in their pocket. They could take photos of anything. Um, yeah, I didn't take photography like really seriously on a professional level until I, I had decided that it was time to um, uh, start doing real estate photography for my own listings and then eventually for a business. Okay. Actually, I have a, I have a similar story because most of the people I interview, they say, oh, I was always into photography. Mine was that I just needed a part-time job and I got a job at a photography studio. <laughs> so that's how I got into okay. it. <laughs> So, um, so tell us a little bit about real estate photography. Now, if you're, you know, and this is architectural photography in general, right? No, there's an important distinction to make there. So when, when we're talking about architectural photography, we're talking about more of a higher end product, something that'll be used by a builder or a designer, uh, something that'll be used for an architect for their portfolio. Um, architectural photography you'll see in like magazines like Architectural Digest for example real estate photography specifically we're talking about uh, real estate listings for sale properties that someone wants to sell it so the, the real estate agent that the person is hiring to sell calls me the photographer to take photos of the listing okay but isn't the photography similar 
like the techniques? No, or no? not exactly. I mean, the, the, a lot of the fundamentals are the same, and a lot of the rules apply to getting a good real estate photography versus architectural photography image. Um, but the overall, the, the business model is different for one, most, or not most, but a lot of architectural photographers will charge instead of just a per job, they'll charge a day rate or they'll take a per diem, which covers a creative fee for the day. They'll have a range of photos that they can make. They can't say I can give you exactly 30 or 40 images. They'll say, I'm going to give you like five or eight images a day. And you can have me for as many days as you want at this rate. Uh, so they make a lot more money. Um, they pr provide fewer quantity in photos, but the individual photo, the quality is like the standard of quality are like top of the line. Like the, you have to be able to provide the best possible images for that space. Um, and they're often even the compositions tend to be a little bit different. The compositions tend to be a bit tighter. Um, in real estate photography, the emphasis is on just showing the space and showing it as best as you can, but you want to just see the whole room and you don't necessarily need the fine detail shots that you would see in an architectural shoot. Mm -hmm. Fine detail like, you know, cropped in or zoomed in on, on a specific space or um, a specific piece of the architecture that's particularly interesting real estate is you just run through it's a build per the job it's a much shorter time on site uh, it's just a totally different business model it's much higher volume um, lower uh, price tag transaction or okay yeah you know it, the other thing I just realized is that um, you know the people I know who are more architectural photographers they're very creative and with real estate photography you, you really need the standard shots the creative stuff yeah, doesn't you fly know, you, as much you have some latitude to try new and interesting things but the expectation is that you're just going to get a ton of really wide shots so you can see the whole house and you're going to make it look nice um, yeah. you, you know, you can do your interior design, more architectural style shots, but you'd have to kind of weave them into your standard real estate shots. Uh, cause that's what the real estate agents are looking for. Okay. So if, if this is something that I want to get into, do, do I need specific gear for real estate photography? Uh, you know, I have certain recommendations, um, but honestly, the barrier to entry to real estate photography is low. So if you're a photographer who's into something else like portraiture or landscapes, or maybe you're not even a professional, you're just a hobbyist. I don't know. Let's say you take pictures of sports or, or, or uh, wildlife or whatever, whatever floats your boat. Um, if you're in a position where you need to or you'd like to add some money to the bottom line, more money than what you're making now, if any, with photography, real estate is one of the best to get into. So when we talk about like getting into it, there's actually a really compelling reason as to why I think a lot of photographers would be interested in this. And we can talk about it more, but the clients are super easy to find and get in front of. Uh, super, super easy. Real estate agents are constantly sharing their contact information. You know where their offices are, who their managers are. Um, it's very easy to contact these people and get clients in the first place. Okay. Um, very easy to, and like I said, it's a high volume, you know, low time on site kind of a deal. Uh, if you're a photographer primarily doing other types of photography, you can fill out those gaps during, during the week. Um, or if you're just doing this kind of as a hobby on the side, you can finance or fund those passion projects by doing real estate photography deals for local real estate agents. Okay, so let's get back to so, gear. Now that we know that you're interested in getting into it, the gear that you need is not, like you, you, you don't have to have the highest quality or, ex, or priced equipment to create high quality real estate images. Um, because the real estate shoot gives you a certain advantages. It's a much slower um, cadence between taking photos compared to like a wedding or, or sports, for example, or like wildlife. Like you only got one split second to get the perfect photo 
everything has to the stars have to literally align for you to get everything you know otherwise nobody's going to care they're going to sell just another image of whatever um in real estate you can set up each shot we put the camera on a tripod as long as you have a sturdy tripod i recommend using a geared head so you can control the the tilt axes but um a good sturdy tripod something that's not going to shake easily around if you standing next to it you know shifting your weight um this means that you can now use longer exposures and still have sharp images and uh, you can have very low iso settings so you don't need to have a camera that has a high uh iso performance or low noise to iso ratio whatever you call it um you can have your camera base iso and you can go up to three or four seconds ex long exposure if you need to uh which is great for certain rooms and when you're the photographer it means that you don't have to have the best camera ever because that that extra five thousand dollars for the new canon whatever is basically for like the top end of the features that cameras can provide and in a real estate shoot you don't need that so we're using a old actually i bought these cameras used when i bought them um, and I talk about that a lot in the podcast as well. Um, I don't even think we mentioned this earlier. I'm, I'm on this show because I run, I host the full-time real estate photographer podcast. Anybody can go to, to learn tons more information about this, but, um, so we're using the, the we'll, Panasonic we'll actually, TH4 for our, our shoots. TH4. And is mm -hmm. it a DSLR uh, or a mirrorless? It's a, it's a, it's a mirrorless camera. It is a micro four thirds sensor um, and it's a hybrid camera too. It's, it's uh, geared, it has video, really good video and stills features. Um, you could probably even call it like prosumer level, not even like high, like professional quality gear. It wasn't even the best camera you could buy when it came out new, which is I think 2014. Uh, but we're using that camera because it's cheap super easy to replace uh which is important because if we're doing a high volume of photo shoots we want to make sure we can replace our gear easily um plus with the with the style or the technique that we use to shoot the listing the we don't ever run into the limitations that you do have with the gh4 right because we we're always operating on base iso micro four thirds sensor which can, this can drive a lot of people crazy it has a really wide depth of field because of the cropped sensor so uh with a lens wide open you can have everything in focus from the tripod to the back corners of the room so you can collect a little bit more light have a higher shutter speed um, and you can move a little bit faster than you could if you're on a full frame camera you'd have to be shooting constantly at like f8 or something like that okay uh, All right. it's That's important to keep everything in focus Yes. <laughs> so, um, and you need a shutter release cable? Yeah, I, I trigger the camera remotely. I use uh, like a cheap $20 Young Nuo radio trigger. Uh, we're, everything we're doing is manual. Everything is being set manually. Uh, we're not doing any TTL. We are, we do use flash. Um, okay. I am, I am holding a depending on, on what kit we're running with, it's either an 8200, which is the first flash I recommend anybody to get, the, the Godox 8200, um, or the uh, AD400, what I'm using for lights. And it's really straightforward. Like you, you set your flash power for uh, however large the room is, however much power you need to fill the room without really burning out, like making hot spots. You set your camera's exposure for the ambient light outside through the windows, and then you take your photo. So your windows are properly exposed. They're not blown out and they're not too dark either. And the room is properly exposed with the flash as well. Okay, so where? how do you position the flashes? Do you have them on light stands? Uh, you know, I used to many... have them on light stands, but that wasn't fast enough for me. So now I'm hand holding the flashes. They uh, they have the quarter twenty mounting screws on them. So um, I got these little screws with like a D ring on them, and then I clip that to to like a like a piece of webbing or or a strap or something, and I wear it kind of like a like a satchel almost on my side, so I can just walk, set the tripod down, level the camera. 
take my ambient shot, which we use later in editing, and then I just point the flash straight up onto the ceiling and bounce. Okay, so let me let me just get my mind around what you're doing, okay? <laughs> okay. So you're taking first you're taking the camera shot with no flash. Mm -hmm. And you're metering for the interior the for the first ambient shot for, for the ambient interior light. We're metering for the ambient interior light. So those are where you're going to get to more longer exposures. And in those shots, we're usually blowing out the windows um, entirely, okay. not even trying to get, you know, some sort of inf the information through the windows. Um, and then when we take the flash photo, uh, we bump up the shutter speed. You know, we'll go from bit, like in, during a standard day. And if you have in like bright direct sunlight coming into the window, that there's a different way of dealing with that. But your run of the mill shot will be at like, let's say a 20th of a second for your ambient, for the interior light, maybe with a few lights on and some sunlight coming in. And then we'll bump it up to like two fifth, one two fiftieth of a second and maybe close the aperture but usually we leave it wide open anyways it depends on how bright it is through the window um because what that second shot with the flash will do is the flash will give you proper um color saturation and hue of all of the colors in the frame um and then you'll use the ambient photo to uh, as a lu luminosity mask in photoshop uh, we can talk about how to do that later, but it adds back that natural kind of ambiance, the natural shadows that were there, and it keeps the photo from looking too weird and too flashy. You, do you know what I'm saying? To um, okay, yeah, I'm, something... I'm still, let, yeah. So let me just back up. Okay, so you're taking sure. the first shot, you're measuring the light with inside the room. Yeah. So the windows are going to be blown out but the rest of the room mm -hmm. is going to look really good, right? Mm -hmm. Then you're taking a second shot and you're pointing the flash up at the ceiling if it's white, <laughs> I assume. Yes. And so that's going to the the Most ceiling's going to act as yeah, the ceiling's going to act as a soft box and spread mm -hmm. that light but so that's going to happen while your camera is got a has a faster shutter speed. So basically the windows mm -hmm. are going to come out. Where yes. are you standing? Are you standing like behind the camera and, and pointing the light at the ceiling? Is that what you're doing? Like in the middle of the ceiling? Uh, usually it depends on, on the room. So I'm trying to put the camera as far back in a corner usually um, as I can to get that really wide shot. And um Depending on the shape of the ceiling and the shape of the room and where I am standing, I'll, I'll usually just point it straight up above the camera where I'm standing. Uh, but sometimes it's not quite good enough. I might end up taking a couple more flash frames or um, the one that I do take. Instead of standing with the camera, I'll move to a different corner of the room, still not visible to the camera. Uh, it, it just depends on the room. It's really uh, – it, it's hard to – give it a rule but what usually works really well is um placing the flash in positions where light would naturally be ple present anyway uh because the shadows tend to be a lot more realistic especially when you blend it with the ambient later layer later um okay. so yeah it's there's so many unique situations. I, I can't say that there's a definite rule or an algorithm to follow. You know, like if the room looks like this and you have to move the flash there. I mean, through trial and error, you can get a really good feel for it. And then um, it'll also depend on the, on the ultimate, the look that you want to go for. It could, because depending on where you place the light, you can get a lot more contrast out of the image too. So if you like to have super contrasty real estate images, you'll put the 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 light more often um farther from the camera but if you don't really care too much you'll put it more behind the camera because then everything's lit more flat and you're just hand holding the light and like aiming it at the ceiling yeah i'm literally like it's it's strapped onto it's hanging on my shoulder and then i just lift it up and point it straight up usually okay all right yeah, that's takes, that's takes interesting 
what about like dark little corners? Like in a, I mean, I could see how that would work great in a smaller room, like a bedroom or a, like my house has all small rooms, but sometimes you go in these mega mansions and they've got these huge, you know, living rooms and there's some mm -hmm. dark little corners. What do you do? Dark corners, like a far corner in the room that's just not getting any light. That's what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, that's uh -huh. that's what I'll go through and I'll take additional uh, flash photos. So I'll take one maybe on the by the camera and then I'll take another one in a different corner of the room. And uh, then, I'll you know, in Photoshop, I'll just layer them and I'll mask myself out and any hot spots out of the uh, additional flash shots and just use the light uh, where I want it. OK, so you'll actually be in the shot and you just. Yeah, yeah, uh, I try out later. If I can help it, Sometimes. I try not to, to save time, to save right. time in editing and to save time on site. So if I can get it all done in one flash frame without me visible at all, I will. But uh, if if there's a problem area, I will I will take that additional photo and be in it. Okay, so even though I'm, I'm all over the place, I know I sent you questions, I'm not following them, <laughs> but- um, <laughs> That's okay. So what about, what about, um, Okay, for instance, I have a bedroom in my house that has those mirrored closet doors along the entire mm -hmm. side. It's a small room. All the house, my house was built, you know, in 1960 or something like that. So all the rooms are small. So, you know, I stand in the doorway to take a picture, but of course I'm in the, the doorway. And, in and the the, reflection. even if I'm not there, the camera's in the, in the reflection. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal, how do you deal with things like that? Yeah, it's even more difficult in bathrooms. Uh, oh, yeah, because they're tiny. Sometimes you get a bathroom that has a mirrored accent wall, an entire wall that is mirrored. There's one case where I shot a bathroom where literally every wall was mirrored, even this weird nook <laughs> where there was like a towel rack. Like even that had mirrors all the way around. It was insane. Um, the best way to deal with reflections is to try to not be in them um and but sometimes you can't really avoid it so then the next best thing to do is to place the camera in a location if you can that has a really consistent background immediately behind it like a plain wall or if there's a you know wallpaper or something something with a simple pattern um because that's super easy to clone out later in Photoshop. And because I'm triggering remotely, I can place the camera, set my composition, and then I can leave the room and trigger the camera. So there's no way I'll be in the reflection. Um, so that's one way of dealing with it. And usually just cloning it out is is going to be step one for me. There is a way, like if, if the reflections are really bad, you could even place, take your photos of the room and then go to the mirror put your camera where the mirror is and then take a shot of the reverse of the room and then Photoshop the reverse photo of the room into the reflection. So it actually looks like really that, like it's real. But that takes a that takes a lot of thinking to try and get the angles to match up right. So I try not to do that when I, if I can help it. Yeah, that sounds hard. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of work. For, for most of your real estate, real estate shoots, it's not really worth it to go through that much effort. Um, I'll do stuff like if the mirror is hanging or if it's the, if there's a mirror where it's like a medicine cabinet on a hinge, I'll grab a paper towel or, um, toilet paper or something like that. Um, make it to like a little ball or a little roll, and then I'll pop it under or underneath or behind the mirror to, to make it stick out a little bit, like to change the angle of the reflection. So instead of looking directly at me in my face, it's reflecting up into the ceiling or, or something like, or a different part of the room. Uh, I, that's, I'll, I'll try, I'll try all those tricks before I try to replace a whole reflection in Photoshop. Wow. Yeah. I never would have thought of that. That's a great idea. Just turn the mirror if you can. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the mirrors seem to be the hardest thing. Now, yeah. They really can be. Do you use a polarizing filter at all if, if there's like glare? No, no. Um, no. If I'm, I mean, if I'm taking an exterior photo, uh, the biggest problem with glare is when, when the house is being backlit by the sun. And 
if, when you're shooting directly into the sun, you can't avoid the lens flare. So uh, what we'll do is we'll either um, use our hand or a hat or something over the lens to just block out the sun out of wherever it is in the sky and uh, take the photo like that and then just do a sky replacement uh, or just move the camera, try and find a good spot where you don't have glare because we're always checking our images as we go. Um, if in three seconds you could just step over a little bit, let a tree block the sun, stop the glare, and you retake the photo, we'd always we always prefer to do that. Um, you know, but yeah, if if we have to, we'll uh, we'll do sky replacements and Photoshop this this the sun. Okay. Now, is there a best time to take pictures as far as inside and outside? I mean, gen like the best times would be right around golden hour. Um, but the, with those, you know, you only really have two good light, two two times during the day where you get good light, and still it can be a toss up depending on the weather. If it's too cloudy or it's too clear or if it's too uh, too hazy, it's tough with dr the drone. Um, or windy is really too windy is tough with the drone too. Um, so, you know, we, we also take photo shoots all day. So we're doing like five or more a day, basically seven days a week. And you can't really just wait for the best lighting because, you know, you get more listings to shoot. So uh, we try and get the best possible exposure in camera and then we just polish it off and, and post. We don't, really worry too much about the lighting. Um, if you were an architectural photographer, you'd be much more strict about that. Uh, but for a standard real estate listing, you can you can get by uh, by shooting any time of the day. You just have to bear in mind a few different tricks to deal with like super harsh, bright sun or really cloudy overcast days. For the exterior, the best time, I mean, you do the exteriors no matter what time, but Mm -hmm. The best time would definitely be the golden hour. Always, always. Or the blue my hour. personal, my personal favorite would be uh, because uh, we're on the east coast. Uh, golden hour during sunrise is the best time for us out here, especially for o oceanfront property. Um, it's it's because kind of brutal to wake up on. at like three or four a.m. to go out and get ready, but yes, you're right. It, the sun will be right on on the horizon and um you know it's just uh, the the colors are really beautiful we get a lot of really nice magentas and and in the in the sky uh so yeah that's my favorite time to shoot but not not too many people book sunrise photo shoots these days and and they don't book because they don't want to pay do you charge extra for that uh generally yes there's a little bit of an upcharge if we're shooting during twilight hours because we're going to be doing a twilight photo um but not by too much more okay okay you would think the customer would listen to you and and do you know whatever you say but on the other hand i have well not too, always <laughs> yeah not always i mean when it comes to so there's real estate agents are they're an interesting kind of uh clientele to work with because real estate agents are salespeople in the sales business they are constantly being sold things too so you know they they can they can be a little cautious when it comes to spending money um, cause they're in the space where everyone's like, buy this, buy this, buy this. You have to pay for that. They're in the real estate brokerage. They're paying for online leads and then they're paying for this other thing. And then they're paying for the special CRM and then this phone service. Like it's, it's, it can be difficult to get more money out of them if they're really budget conscious. There's some real estate agents that they're, they're, they're like, I don't care if it's a, the house is a piece of crap. You're still going to do everything that you can do. Um, and then some agents will have us come out to a, like a really amazing, a luxury listing over a million dollars and they'll want like the bare minimum of work done. So it, it kind of depends on the personality of who you're dealing with too. Okay, so let's talk about a crap house. So let's say you are hired by a real estate agent to go and mm -hmm. photograph 
a duplex and it's a rental property and the renters don't want to move. So it's messy and icky. What do you do? Well, there's um, there's a couple things that we'll do in these situations because they do happen. I mean, generally, the real estate agent is in charge of the sale of the property, and it's their responsibility to get it ready for sale, to manage, you know, booking the photographer, coordinating with tenants. Um, there's been situations that I where. <laughs> I've had clients like have a sneakily drive by and take exteriors because it's like a bank owned property and the tenant or the the person that's being foreclosed on, they won't let anyone in the house. Yeah, we've done that before. Um, I mean, we've shown up to houses where one of my photographers called me after a shoot and said that this guy was following him around and messing up the room in front of him. <laughs> and he's being super rude. <laughs> I'm, and I was like, what, why, why did you wait to call? First off, I was like, why did you wait to call me until after you're leaving? You should have, this, this should have been like the second this guy started that you should have called me. Um, <laughs> but the, so the guy was a tenant in a three family home in Boston and Boston recently passed um, an, an ordinance about Airbnb listings that basically shut a bunch of people down and, um, this guy was one of them. So the seller wanted to sell the house. The tenant, the tenant's Airbnb business basically fell apart overnight and he was mad. So when my photographer was going through, he wanted to try and prevent people from ever wanting to see the house. I don't know what this guy was thinking, but my, my photographer would like tidy up the room, move stuff around. And then this guy would come and he'd mess up the bed. He'd take the lamp and then he'd gently lay it down on the floor to make it look like it was just tossed there He'd like dump stuff out of drawers. It was it was crazy. And, you know, in those situations, uh, when anyone books a photo shoot with me, I take a booking fee in advance. And if in an event like this, we have a crazy tenant making life difficult uh, and we have to leave or we can't complete the photo shoot, I still take the booking fee and then the agent will have to pay again and have us come out again. Okay. All right. So, all right, let's just say it's a normal place. Do you, what do you do like for staging? Are there any tips that you, or anything specifically that most people don't see that you should look out for? Um, I mean, the, what seems to get the people, what seems to get the most people is uh, reflections in non mirrors. Uh, most of us are pretty aware of like, oh, I can't be in the mirror reflection, but like, uh, stainless steel appliances, coffee pots, um, oven windows, microwave oven windows, uh, really shiny tile or uh, reflections on glass in 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 like sliding glass uh, shower windows or other doors in the house. That that seems to get a lot of people. Uh, people that will catch a, even the smallest mistakes will still sometimes get caught in reflections. So. Um, that's probably the the biggest place where people make mistakes. So just be aware of reflections, or at least know how to deal with it in Photoshop. Um, if it's a stain, if it's an appliance surface, uh, generally the reflection is really low fidelity anyway. So uh, we just mask it out and then uh, cut out that section or copy it, however and however we want to do it, and then uh, just add a lot of blur, just make it super blurry. So you can't even tell if there's a reflection there. It's it's a really fast way of dealing with that. Um, with windows, yeah, that can be kind of difficult, especially with your flash, because the flash can create a hotspot in the glass of the window. So when you get that exposure mm -hmm. where you can see clear to through to the outside, uh, sometimes there'll be a big white blotch. So for those, I'll, I'll just move the flash and take another photo. Um, and if the second photo is just as good or better as the first one, sans the hotspot in the window, I'll delete the first one and just use that single flash frame to save time. Um, if it adds something to it, or the only thing it adds is just the removal of that hotspot, um, then you know I'll keep them both in that case. But yeah, that's reflections are are the biggest thing to do, to 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 worry about um the next biggest mistake that most real estate photographers will make is uh, toilet seats toilet paper 
and paper towels and uh, and hand towels, like in the kitchens and bathrooms, especially. People will leave out old, ratty, disgusting looking rags. They'll leave toilet seats up. Uh, paper towel will be all like scratched and jagged and, and crazy looking. Um, if it takes one second to just like turn the roll to the side so it's not obvious to see the ugly looking jagged edges or, you know, to just drop the toilet seat lid down or, you know, just do something. Like it, it, it's it's so irritating to get one of those things in the photos. Uh, one of the worst to fix is the toilet seats. To Photoshop in a closed toilet seat lid is like such a pain in the neck. Um, it's a huge pet peeve of mine. Uh, okay. Close and it's really common, <laughs> really common, common mistakes. Yeah. Uh, windows and blinds not being consistent heights. Um, never mind throughout oh, the whole house, one. but in an individual photo, people will do that. They'll take a photo, they'll look at it later, and they'll be like, oh, great. The, especially from the outside, from exterior images. Uh, that will throw me off a lot. Like if the different levels of the house aren't at similar um, distances of being open, if they're all like all over the place, like a like a sound design board, like some are all the way open, some are shut, some are in the middle. That's an, that's so annoying. Okay, so how do you get the lines to be straight? So because in real estate, especially if you have smaller rooms, right, you're going to have converging lines. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? Yeah, that's a big problem. So we're not going to worry about our horizontal lines, only our vertical lines. The horizontal okay. lines can converge any which way they want to. Um, but generally, you want to straighten out your verticals. And when we say straighten out your verticals, we don't mean make them true level, like as, as if you're holding a level on the object itself. But you want to make them look properly vertical in the image meaning the left and right edges of your frame if you were to drag a line that's perfectly parallel to the edge of your frame every vertical line matches it lines up okay. perfectly so that's that's okay. what we want and the easiest way to do that is to shoot on a tripod and level the camera um i mentioned earlier i used a gear a geared head which just has three knobs for your three tilt axis axes axes is right right I think that's the right word. Uh, your three tilt axes. Uh, so you can adjust, you know, tilting forward, backward, left and right, and then um, uh, uh, twisting side to side. So this way you can perfectly level your camera, and then you basically don't even have to apply um, any kind of perspective adjustments afterwards if it's done properly in camera. There are situations there, uh, where you don't want to do it properly in camera. Okay. Well, we, what are you going to ask? Does it matter where the height of the camera is? Or where, I guess the better question is, where yes. should the height of the camera be? Yeah, so uh, most of my shots, uh, the camera is going to be about at the same height as a light switch would be. Um, I don't... I don't like measure wherever the center of the sensor is from the distance, distance to the floor. But uh, generally, if I'm, you know, around that height or for me, like somewhere on, in the middle of my chest usually is, is a pretty good height um, because the you're just about splitting the difference between the ceiling and the floor. Uh, so the compositions tend to be a little bit more symmetrical that way between ceiling and floor. Uh, there are some cases where I will raise or lower the tripod depending on whatever composition I want to go for, but my defaults would be like that height, like the switch height, and then I'll I'll go up and down um, as needed if I really need to. Um, there is a scenario where you would want to take a photo with the verticals out of alignment and then realign them later. And that's when you want to do a fake tilt shift. So are you familiar with the tilt shift lenses? I am, but maybe my audience is not. So, Okay, so a tilt shift lens can is a special kind of a lens. They're very expensive. Uh, they're all manual lenses, and they can do two things. They can tilt, and they can shift. Uh, tilting, I mean, literally, like the lens can tilt up and down, like you're bending a bendy straw. 
that kind of a tilt, right? Okay. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and that changes your focal plane. Um, and that has some interesting effects there that almost nobody uses. I mean, you would, but for a very specific situation. Um, that's tilting. And then shifting shifts the lens over the sensor, um, maintaining the perspective of wherever the height is, but it's changing your composition. Um, so the best example of that would be, you know, if you take a photo tilted down and then you see all the converging lines, right? And then in Photoshop, you level it out. That is what the tilt, sh that's what shifting the lens is going to do. It's going to keep the verticals vertical, but it's going to change your perspective. Like if your camera is up a little bit high and then you can see clear over the top of a table mm -hmm. and then you shift the lens down, you'll still have that perspective and see clean over the top of the table, but you'll also see all the way down to the floor. Whereas if you had physically dropped the camera instead of shifting it, you would change your perspective. Of, so instead of seeing clean over the top of the table, now your eye is in line with the edge of the table. So instead of seeing a table surface, you just see like a brown stripe of the edge of the table. Is that, it's a little more okay. difficult to explain. But there's a, a really interesting implication that, with the tilt shift lens that, you know, it lets you get compositions that you couldn't otherwise get unless you did a fake tilt shift, which a lot of people don't like to do because it forces you to distort and crop the image. So you lose image resolution um, <clears throat> and you're not getting the best possible uh, image quality when you're doing that. So but for you your run of the mill real estate listings. So to do a fake tilt shift is to physically tilt the camera and then adjust the vertical lines and post. Um, and there's, there's some, there's very specific situations where you want to do that. Well, like in this situation where I just mentioned, maybe the space that you're in is a little tight. You want to show the top of the table, but you also want to show the bottom of the table too, or the floor. Uh, but you want to have a perspective like you're looking over the top. Um, you can tilt your camera down so you have that perspective. I'm looking down at the table. And then in post, when you straighten out the lines, you get basically what would be the tilt shift look. Okay. Okay. But you don't do that very often, but you can. No, not very often. I find that the uh, vertical alignment tool in Lightroom is not always perfect especially if the level was slightly off in the camera. Like if you're tilting down and then you're canted to one side, not perfectly level um, on on one of your other axes, then that can kind of throw um, the software off a little bit and then you have to do manual adjusting. So it, it'll, take, it'll take a lot more time. Um, but for those specific shots where... Uh, you know, it really warrants it, we'll do that. I'll, we'll, more often we'll do those outside. Um, if the house is really big um, and the client did not want drone uh, or, you know, the house is like up on a hill, you know, we'll take the photo, we'll tilt the camera up, the verticals will be way off, but then we'll correct the verticals in post. It's, it would be, it's similar to using a tilt shift. Okay. And my, hey, my advice is if you're going to be fixing it in post like that, you need to shoot as wide as you can because it is going to crop out the sides a little bit, right? Uh, a lot of it, actually, depending on how much, uh, depending on how how far you've tilted, you'll be distorting a ton of the of the image. Um, so yeah, we try not to do it too much, and GH4 doesn't have a huge uh, raw file either, so we we try not to have too extreme of a tilt, and we try not to do a fake tilt shift too often. Um, but I mean, mo most of the times when we're doing that, it, you, you can barely even tell that it was even done in the first place. So, you know, we've been, um, it's been, it's been, it's been a pretty handy technique so far. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I straighten in Lightroom or Photoshop all the time for different things. So I'm just really familiar mm -hmm. with doing it in, in post. <laughs> I'm not a real estate photographer, but I do other things that where I need to do it. Yeah, well, when you take like 100 images, 100 raw files, and you have to straighten all of them, it's like you, you try to have those kind of edits uh, cut down to as few as possible. So let, let's talk about editing, okay? So let's mm -hmm. take let's take the first picture we talked about. We, we did a, a bedroom, and mm -hmm. we 
used the, the first we overexposed the window, then we did the flash. Let's say we did the flash twice on the ceiling, two different mm -hmm. places. So I have three pictures. Mm -hmm. what, how do I? What do I do? How do I process that? Sure. Walk so me first we the take. Simple way. <laughs> yeah. So so first we actually for the first thing we do is we back all of our files up. Uh, I'll usually even back up files in the driveway. I have my laptop open in the passenger seat uh, with my rugged drive. So I'll back everything up, and then when we get it to the editor. So I'm not, I built up, we didn't even talk about this. I built up a team. So I'm, I'm occasionally still doing photo shoots. Um, but nowadays it's mostly my, my team that's doing the legwork. So my photographers will take the photos, they'll back up the files and then they will upload them to the editor. So we take the photos into Lightroom and we get a Lightroom pre, we use a Lightroom preset to, uh, do some gentle color and exposure edits to the raw files. And then we'll go through and we'll check them one at a time. We'll check the white and black points. We'll check the color, contrast, and saturation, um, and the white balance and make sure that everything looks the way that it should. And then uh, we'll import all the photos into Photoshop. And we usually will import all of them before we start editing, because we'll do like a batch edit. Um, so we'll basically go through, if it's a series of two photos, then we'll highlight all two, we'll right click, select edit, and then add it as layers in Photoshop. If it's three images, we edit, we send over the three images or whatever we ended up choosing. And then in Photoshop, when we send all of these groups of photos at once before we start editing, uh, it opens up a ton of tabs. So we'll have 30 or 40 tabs open in Photoshop with the raw files loaded. And then we apply a Photoshop action. So we've created a Photoshop action that will follow these steps. It aligns all of the images. It converts the ambient image, image into a uh, luminosity mask. It adds a layer for contrast it adds a layer for color correction a, a um, curves layer for color correction um and uh what else do we do and then we create a couple layer masks um when we apply an act the photoshop action we apply the action to the entire batch so we have it uh operate on all of the currently open files in photoshop it runs through the whole shoot does run it completes the action and then the editor will go through each photo one at a time to manually kind of adjust uh the masks so um, okay so in the layer masks he's basically just using a black brush to to um edit out stuff that you don't want in there exactly exactly so let's say we had a photo with two flash frames uh the the action the photoshop action only combined the ambient and then the first flash photo that was there. So then what you do is you take the second flash frame, you drag it on top. Uh, usually we'll put it into light mode and then we'll just lasso around whatever area we want to show. Lasso around it and then click on the layer mask button. So it hides everything around that area. And then we'll adjust the, uh, the feather of the mask or we'll use a soft round brush and we'll change the, um, the flow rate on the brush, not the opacity. We'll change the flow, uh, and we'll go down as low as like two or three percent on the flow, um, and and just kind of like really subtly bring shadows back or hide them, depending on which layer mask we're working on, or whether we're painting in black or white. Um, but yeah, it's you know it's kind of massaging the images until they're satisfactory. Then you hit Control S, save the photo because you imported the photo from Lightroom into Photoshop from within Lightroom. When you hit use your hotkey control or command S to save it, it'll save and automatically send that photo back into Lightroom. So we'll go through control S, close the tab, control S, close the tab until all the tabs are closed and all the photos have been edited. Then back in Lightroom, a final check on all of the photos to make sure everything is looking satisfactory. Um, Exterior photos are different, I should mention. Exterior photos are rarely edited in, in Photoshop unless we really need to make some changes. Uh, generally, we're just using a Lightroom preset and then 
those first basic edits because one good exterior exposure is usually enough uh, for the edit. Um, but like I said before, if there's a sky replacement that needs to happen, um, then we take it into Photoshop or uh, we get the exteriors in that first edit and then we review everything before uh, the editor uh, sends it all up for approval. My admin takes a look at the files, approves them, and then sends them out to the listing agent. Okay, awesome. All right. So it sounds like you know you 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 need to learn some Photoshop skills. <laughs> you know what? Uh, you you might need to, depending on how you want to run your business. Uh, generally, photographers are going to have some Photoshop and Lightroom skills. And you can jump on YouTube right now and search real estate photography. How do I edit a real estate image and get a ton of visual visual content from really good real estate photographers. We'll show you exactly how to do the edit. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, I hired my editor not because I didn't want to do the edits. If I'm being honest, I pref I enjoy editing the photos more than I do shooting them, but it's all it's for time. Um, you know, in my podcast, the full-time real estate photographer podcast, and in the full-time real estate photographer book, they both have the same name. I focus a lot of my time and attention on the business side of the business um, because it's so important to, you can get a camera and you can learn how to edit and that's nice, but if you can't bring money in, then, you know, what's the point? So, yeah, so, uh, so so tell us what came first, the podcast or the book? The book, actually. Uh, so I, I always had an interest in writing, even from when I was little. And I would always keep like little journals and things. I think when I was like four or five years old. No, no, I must have been older than that. When did I learn how to write? I was I was young when I learned how to write. I was really young. And I had like, I still have it somewhere, the spy journal uh, on my siblings watching them watch tv or i don't know what kind of stupid stuff i've always enjoyed writing and uh there's it came at some point probably towards the no it, it was while i was in the military actually where i said you know what if i'm going to spend time writing why don't i focus my attention on a specific project and you know since then i published a couple different books i've couple, actually three books and uh, one of them is the full-time real estate photographer. And I, I wrote this because in my business, and we probably should have brought this up at the very beginning, but my business, I, I was able to start it really quickly. When I decided to pull the trigger and say, you know, I, I'm going to take this real estate photography thing seriously and try and make a business of it, um, it was just a couple months before I started to replace my other sources of income wow. and and uh, not in the not that first calendar year but within that first 12 months of starting that business i broke through six figures in revenue and okay. it's gone up ever since okay um, so this can be a really 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 good business and you know as we were growing and we're still growing but as i started hiring staff then I started having more free time during the day and you know that's where i got the ideas of you know i like to write i like to teach and share things my mother's a teacher um probably why i got into writing and reading so young um but you know it, it's uh, something about it's really fun and interesting to me and and i just i just like to share uh, uh and teach people so I, I i wrote the book i published that um, it was received pretty well. I also really like uh, uh, podcasts. I consume podcasts um, on a daily basis. So, uh, and I also enjoy doing audio production and, and working with video. Um, I've been getting a lot more into video for the, the real estate uh, clients, doing client testimonial videos, real estate videos. Um, so I said, why don't I do a podcast? And yeah, things just kind of, as I started to have more time to think about doing projects like that are more personal or fun, um, that's that's where I started to actually work on these. Tell us the name of the book and the podcast again. Full-time real estate photographer. It's the same name for the book and for the podcast. 
and, and, and the podcast you can find on iTunes and Stitcher and yes, you can find the podcast on all the major podcasting apps. Uh, it's it's on iTunes, it's on Spotify, it's on the Google Play Store or whatever the podcasting thing is for them. Um, yeah, I think we're on ten. 10 of the biggest uh, podcasting platforms. So that shouldn't be too hard to find. Uh, and the book is on Amazon. You can just search full-time real estate photographer. Um, you can search my name uh, if you want to venture trying to spell it. But uh, you'll, you, if you search my name, you'll see all the other books. Only one of them is the photography book. So just generally, how, do, how does the audience find you? Okay, we can find you on the podcast. We can find your book mm -hmm. on Amazon. How else? Honestly, that's that's the only place I'd want to send you. If you're a photographer and you're thinking about real estate photography, go to the podcast first. If you're a photographer and you're thinking, you know, I'd like to start making money for the first time ever, ever or to add a few hundred or maybe depending on how far you want to go with it, a few thousand dollars a week to your bottom line. I know you can do it with real estate photography. And I talk about this in the podcast constantly of how we do it and not just you know, hey, look at me, I've got a business and how do you like that? It's it's me breaking down individual business concepts in a way that, you know, you're not just going to get information, but you're going to get the recipe for like what you need to do and, and how you're going to do it. Um, business at the end of the day is all about taking actions and doing things. So when I share some information, I want to share it in a way that you can then take action and do something with it. So the first place I'd want to send anybody is podcast because it's okay. free, free, easy to access. Um, and you can kind of cherry pick the information you want to listen to. If you want something more, I'd say check out the book. Uh, you can find the book on Amazon. Um, if you wanted to... Uh, you could reach out to me directly. I share my my contact info in each podcast. You can find it there and uh, order a book through me directly or order it on Amazon. Uh, if you order it through me, I'll write you a cute little note, a special thank you because of uh, Amazon's uh, royalty split is not that great. Tell me about it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's less than 50%. Um, and then, you know, for the really advanced users, I also, I also offer uh, business coaching for real estate photographers. But if you're brand new or you don't have much of a business go, you're the, to go off of, really the podcast is the first place to go. That's the first place okay. to go. Um, because business coaching, it's, it's expensive and it's a little more intensive. Um, and I don't like having people, I mean, sometimes they insist on it, but I prefer to not have people to just do like a weekly therapy session. I'd rather have actual coaching and help you make moves in your business. Okay. All right. So we are going to find the podcast called the full-time real estate photographer. And it's Tom Vargelettis, Vargelettis, V-A-R-G-E. Vargelettis. Yep. V-A-R-G-E-L-E-T-I-S. Right? Yes. <laughs> That's a long name. <laughs> uh, I know. I know. It's the only one I got. So. Well, thank you so much for being on the Understand Photography Show. Thanks for having me. And we are going to put um, in the show notes on understandphotography.com, we're going to put links to Tom's information, links to the podcast, links to his book, so that you can find him very easily. And hopefully he will share a few real estate photography pictures with us so you can see some of his work. I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you so much for watching the Understand Photography Show. Remember, check us out at understandphotography.com.